Live from the Hoboken Studios in New Jersey, I'm Tom Anderson. This is Terrific Talk. Terrific Talk Podcast. Welcome back, Terrific Talk Podcast. Here comes the host. I'm your host, Tom Anderson. Behind the back, it gets to Buckner. Here comes Lloyd, and the Mets win it. Back, 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 Welcome to Terrific Talk. Today's episode is brought to you by my bookie, where you bet is just as important as who you're betting on. And if you want to make money betting the games, you got to go to mybookie.ag. They have odds on every matchup and a mobile site that makes wagering on your smartphone a breeze. Join now and my bookie will match your deposit with up to a 50% bonus. Just use the promo code Terrific to activate the offer. Visit mybookie.ag. Use the promo code Terrific today. You play, you win, you get paid. I've got a great episode today. Dave McMenamin is a New York Times best-selling author and NBA reporter for ESPN. He's on the ground with the Cleveland Cavaliers, and I thought it would be great to have him on today, given this crazy Cavs start. He's a fantastic reporter, someone I've been following for years, so let me bring him in here. Dave McMenamin, welcome to Terrific Talk. Thanks for having me on, Tom. So before we get to the Cavs, the main reason I'm having you on today is because I like talking with successful people in this business, and I want to give listeners a chance to see the journey, see how successful people have gotten to where they are. So we'll start here. Where are you from? Where did your love of basketball and writing come from? <laughs> well, success is all relative, for sure. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite uh, terms when it comes to success is uh, it's on loan and rent is due every day. But um, <laughs> I, I'm good. from the Philly suburbs, and nice. uh, I grew up uh, a hoop head. Uh, my older sister played, and she was a big, uh, you know, Detroit Bad Boys fan. Uh, I kind of went counterculture to her, and uh, rooted for the Bulls and Michael Jordan, and uh, that's kind of where the love started. And you know, I, I was a bench player on my high school team. Uh, worked really hard just to be that, and continued to kind of put the two things together, the writing side, the reporting side. In high school, I was fortunate uh, at Radnor High School in the Philly suburbs um, to have a TV station there, a uh, local access TV. So I had my own television show, sports talk show, and I wrote nice. a paper, and I wrote for some uh, like local county papers uh, in, in the area where I grew up. I was able to cover Villanova basketball. When I was still in high school, cover Villanova football when they were very successful with Brian Westbrook, who ended up to be a great running back for the Philadelphia Eagles. And, um, you know, just kind of continued it on uh, Syracuse University and, and, and kept the two things going. I was a manager for the basketball team there, uh, won the championship in uh, 2003 when I was a, a sophomore. Cool. And um, uh, continue to do this stuff uh, ever since. You mentioned Syracuse. Sounds like you had a great college experience there. And then your first job out of college was as a high school basketball assistant coach. But because <laughs> that didn't pay a lot, you also had to work, I read, in a Halloween store part-time. Forget the coaching year. <laughs> I want to know all about this Halloween store job. What did they have you do? Were you dressing up? It, what What happened? Uh, it was very humbling, uh, I guess, looking <laughs> back at it. Uh, I was in San Diego. I moved there. Uh, well, actually, a couple of my high school friends already moved out there. I spent the entire summer after graduation um, working college basketball camps up and down the East Coast. Uh, not quite sure what I wanted to do. I knew journalism uh, was something that piqued my interest, but I was in the gym every single day um, of college basketball seasons for four straight years. Yeah. And to give up that lifestyle wasn't something I really wanted to walk away from. So I got offered an assistant coaching job out in San Diego, and I was like, all right, I have friends out there, and you know, uh, who doesn't want to live in Pacific Beach? Let's let's make this happen. But it literally paid a stipend of a couple thousand dollars. <laughs> I needed to find a way to pay the bill. So I uh, I walked down the street, and there was a now hiring sign at, at the, a pop up Halloween costume <laughs> store shop, and and the guy was paying me under the table, like I think like. $25 an hour, maybe. Nice. Um, and, um, you know, it did everything from stocking shelves to standing outside the store holding up a sign saying, you know, Halloween costumes in here wearing a bright <laughs> orange, like, NASA jumpsuit <laughs> costume. So awesome. Uh, it was quite the experience. LeBron and the Cavs are super into Halloween. Do they know about this history? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you're like... I, I, I shared that in an interview like 10 years ago, and you're one of the only people who brought it up since, so kudos to you. But no, I, I, 
I had I had fun with Halloween back in the day, but uh, not to the extent that the Cavs do now. I don't think I quite have the budget to keep up with their costume. Uh, <laughs> yeah, LeBron right. costume had to have cost him. I mean, we're talking thousands of dollars to get that custom made, Pennywise. Uh, the it clown was amazing. Mask. It was amazing. It's yeah. super scary. Um, all right, so you got your first big break at NBA.com. You got to be a features editor and writer. During your time there, I know you were a ghost writer on Gilbert Arenas' blog, which I don't know if people remember that, but this thing was huge. It blew up. I read it all the time. How did you get that job ghost writing? How did it all work with Gilbert? It, it was a little bit of uh, fortunate circumstances. Our senior writer, who probably would have been assigned to do that blog was over in in europe um the nba used to take a couple teams every year to europe and did called it um europe live for training camp mm-hmm. and so he hadn't gotten back yet and i was pretty fresh on the job and so they you know the time it went to me and i took the train down from new york to dc and was supposed to only get like 10 minutes with him in person for the first blog entry and we went for about a half hour, just had a, a good initial rapport. And, and, you know, we were only about a year a year apart in age. And um, I'm a basketball freak, and, and he is too. And that was kind of the common language we shared. And, and it just kind of went from there to the point where the initial setup was, I would call Wizards PR, and they would hand the, the phone over to Gilbert. And, and, you know, we would do it maybe twice a month to... Uh, just Gilbert and I would text one another to do the blog post to Gilbert would text me <laughs> when he wanted to do the blog <laughs> post and we do several posts a week. So uh, it was, a, it was a good thing when it lasted and it's something I'm proud of looking back at because you know, this is really before Twitter was a big thing, certainly before players tribune right. um, or other outlets like that where, where athletes were really doing something with their own voice. And, and this was, um, you know, I, I think we were a little bit on the cutting edge when you look back at it. Way ahead of the curve, and that blog was so fun to read. I loved it. Um, okay, so next you go to L.A. You get a job with ESPN, I think. How did the ESPN job come about? Well, during the 2008 finals, I interviewed, when I was still at NBA.com, I interviewed with ESPN at a Boston hotel room uh, nice. for uh, a job with True Hoop. Um, it's, uh, Henry Abbott uh, was running True Hoop and had just been re- acquired by ESPN, and they were allowing him to kind of add some staff below him. And, um, and also, you know, kind of build out that blog network of, of team oriented blogs. Um, so I interviewed and, and the job ended up going to Kevin Arnovitz, but I, you know, had made some inroads with the people that matter on the ESPN NBA side. And so, you know, about a year, year or so later, um, after I was already in LA and after I had worked for, um, the Turner broadcasting iteration of NBA.com the first year after they started their partnership with NBA Entertainment, um, it, you know, kind of came to my attention. They were starting this this string of local sites, and ESPN Chicago was already up, and I think maybe ESPN Boston had already started, um, yeah. and then ESPN LA was the third one. Then New York and Dallas followed. Uh, but uh, I was able to kind of, based on the inroads I already had with the True Hoop gig, get in front of the people that mattered out in LA for the Lakers gig, and. Um, yeah, fortunately, I got got the job, and it's been with ESPN ever since. I started in uh, December 2009. Great timing to go out to be uh, covering the Lakers, too. I, I got to tell you, Kobe's my favorite player of all time. One of my dog names is Kobe. Big Kobe guy here on the <laughs> podcast. Uh, I know you love Kobe, too. You got to cover him up close as the beat reporter there with the Lakers. Can you tell me a good Kobe story? <laughs> well, one uh, a personal Kobe story is – I. Again, I'm from the Flea suburbs, and oh, yeah. my high school was rivals with his high school. Actually, tonight, uh, this Monday, uh, November 6th, my high school is playing his high school in football for the 120, 121, I don't even know how you say that, 121st time? There you go. Uh, <laughs> which is it's one of the, I think, five or ten longest running football rivalries in high school wow. football in the country. Um, and, you know, it, it's to the point where whatever team wins, that high school gets a day off. <laughs> like oh, it, wow. it's kind of a big Super deal. Serious. There's this pep rally, all that stuff. Nice. And so when I was out in LA, the first time covering a game, um, I must have been 22, 23 years old. This before I lived in LA full time. I approached Kobe in the locker room after the game, and I said, "Oh, you know, I'm, I'm for Radner." He goes, "What are you talking to me for?" Uh, still <laughs> running that rivalry run uh, kind of deep. And then later on, when I was in LA covering him on a full time basis. It was a playoff game, and he uh, basically tackled Shannon Brown because he was so excited that Shannon Brown made a good play. Like he <laughs> chest bumped him, and Ch- Shannon Brown fell to the ground. Nice. And I uh, asked him in the post game press conference, you know, that's 
showing a lot of emotion. I mean, uh, what does it mean <laughs> to show that in, in a playoff game versus a regular season game? And he goes, Dave, it's not like this is Radnor versus Strathaven. Strathaven oh, man. High school in our Central League uh, uh, kind of past, um, which was really funny. That's nationally televised press conference on NBA TV. And, and <laughs> no one's going to get that. Dropping a reference to a super <laughs> random high school that's really only going to get. Awesome. That's cool. Um, what's a big piece of advice you can give young aspiring writers out there who want to work at ESPN one day and cover the NBA? From my experience, I, I think what's worked for me is I decided what I wanted to do pretty young, and I'd never really kind of looked back. Uh, so if you have that inclination, you have that passion, uh, you should uh, pursue it 100%. And um, you know, when I was, by the time I graduated high school, I had already had my own TV show. I was an intern on a TV show at NBC in Philadelphia. I wrote for three different newspapers, um, and I did some freelance work for Slime Magazine. Uh, so if, if you already know what you want to do and you're serious about it, then actually be serious about it. Um, people are more accessible than ever. I'm on your podcast right now because you reached out to me on Twitter. <laughs> um, yeah. that's, that's the way things work. I, I wish I had the same accessibility that is available to people now when I was younger. Uh, so, you know, uh, I, I think you have to take it seriously though. And, and I don't mean that like your tone doesn't have to be serious in terms of what you write, but um, you should be consuming as much media as possible. If there is a new platform that becomes part of uh, what people do and, 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 you know, how they experience sports and news, you better know how to use it. Um, I've tried to not become a dodgy reporter in, in the sense of, you know, I, I do, I take a, an Instagram photo, uh, at least one every game and trying to have like a, a, a series uh, that I'll chronicle the cap season with. I do the same thing on Twitter. Um, you Snapchat, uh, you know, it, that is the way I think if you're a young person trying to make an impression on the people that are going to hire people, um, would more likely, most likely, be older and and perhaps not quite as um, you know fluent in the language of, of new media. That's where you can impress people, and I, I would I would suggest you know the same way where you know I like to talk to my little brother about what music he's listening to because I don't feel like I, I'm in that same stream. Um, you should be uh, not only what you produce as a young person can be something that would be valuable to a company, but your tastes are also valuable. And, um, but, but, you know, I, I would say just, just think of it like you're doing it for preparation. I used to always joke to my mom, like if it was time for me to go to bed, I'm watching a Bulls game on WGN, uh, late nineties and it's 1130 or whatever. And I have to get six for school the next morning. I said, well, you know, I'm doing this for my career. I have to watch it. <laughs> um, and it, it, like, it was a little ridiculous to say, but it ended up True. panning yeah. out. Um, and, uh, I, I think if, if you approach it that way, if you approach it, like you're trying to build towards something, um, you're more of a conscious mind while you're doing it versus, you know, maybe I'll do that or, you know, it could be fun or, you know, um, yeah. This job is, is extremely fun. Last Friday night, I was in the nation's capital covering LeBron James score 57 points against a Wizards team that just went on national TV and said they were the best team in the East to race on nickel. It <laughs> amazing. was amazing. Uh, but there's a lot of <laughs> things that aren't amazing about the job, and you have to be willing to put as, just as much effort and enthusiasm into those to be able to relish those other moments. Quick break to talk about my bookie. Holiday cash. You need it, and I know where to get it. My bookie is the place to score serious cash on your sports predictions. Got to go to mybookie.ag. They have odds on every matchup and a mobile site that makes wagering on your smartphone a breeze. Join now and my bookie will match your deposit with up to a 50% bonus. Use the promo code terrific. Activate the offer. Promo code terrific. Visit mybookie.ag. You play, you win, you get paid. Now, back to ESPN's Dave McMenamin. Real quick, just want to talk Cavs. The big question, obviously, on everyone's mind is what's going on with the Cavs right now? They just lost to a terrible Hawks team. They're in 12th place in the East. 
still early. You just wrote a great piece talking about how the bench is kind of getting fed up with the starters. What, what to you is going on with the Cavs right now? What's the problem here? It's multi-layered. Uh, I think the fact that they're the oldest roster in the league is not helping them. You know, yeah. Ken Bazemore is playing power forward against the Cavs. Yeah. Um, you know, Brooklyn Nets uh, beat the Cavs, and they played Joe Harris, who could barely get off the Cavs bench a couple of years ago, as their stretch for it's that style of play, and the Cavs, especially without having Isaiah Thomas in the lineup right now, don't really have the best pieces to push the pace. Um, and that's part of it. Uh, I think just the general fit of trying to fit so many new guys together in a short amount of time um, because they didn't have a, sh- you know, a long training camp. Uh, it was the entire NBA had a shortened training camp, but the Cavs in particular because LeBron James was hurt for most of it, they weren't able to – figure out what it's like to play with LeBron and, and as great as LeBron is, there is an adjustment to that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think they've also just had uh, some knickknack injuries here and there. You know, I mentioned yeah. LeBron's ankle and, uh, J.R. Smith missed some time. Dwayne Wade's missed some time. Derek Rose missed some time. Um, it just, Iman Jumper, uh, Tristan Thompson, Everybody. Um, even Kevin Love missed half the Hawks loss because he had to go to the hospital during the game. So uh, you, I think you put all that together, it's not too surprising that they're a middling 500 team. Uh, if and when they get Isaiah Thomas back fully healthy, I expect them to look a lot more like the contender they've looked like the last couple of years. If Isaiah doesn't return to that level, though, they could have some, some serious problems and, and really have an up and down year. You brought up a great point. The Cavs have been struggling with the three ball this year, and that's something Isaiah Thomas obviously is really good at last year with the Celtics, so they need him. What's the latest the Cavs are saying about Isaiah Thomas? Well, I watched Isaiah Thomas work out uh, before the Hawks game, 30 minutes, full sweat, sprinting up and down the court. Um, all one-on-zero activities, of course, but he looked like an NBA basketball player ready to play a game, and I commented to a couple – uh, commented to Paul Cavs staffer saying, this guy's not going to take seven more weeks to get on the court. Like, you got to be kidding me. Wow. And they went to the, uh, you know, uh, default answer of, well, it's a slow grind for him. Uh, mm-hmm. I, they have not changed this timeline. I tried to ask Kobe Altman about it, Ty Lue about it, his agent about it. No one will change this timeline. But based on what I'd seen, so far, I would be very surprised if he had returned um, well before late December. Nice. Great. Dave, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on today. Everybody check out Dave's great reporting on ESPN.com. Follow him on Twitter. His handle is at MC10, 10 spelled out. Dave, thanks again. Come back on anytime. Okay, thanks, Tom. 